2011, I encountered my first encounter with the law. I got pulled over. I was intoxicated and had a lot of cocaine in my in my truck, and I encountered my very first arrest. And I went down to jail, and I had arrived in a place that I said I would never go. After my very first mugshot, um, I was devastated. It was on the internet, and I was doing everything I could to make this mugshot go away. And little did I know I was stimulating it where more people would see it. I, I said, I'm never drinking alcohol. I'm never doing drugs again. And when I got released, I got back to my apartment, and I took one sip of alcohol, and I was drunk and high again that night. You know, I'm becoming this man that I thought I would never be. In four years, I accumulated 27 mugshots. Each mugshot was more of a give up. I went to a dark place. And I turned to drugs and alcohol more than ever, and then getting rearrested. And on my 27th mugshot, I knew it was over. And I was about to go to prison for a long time. They transferred me to a aggravated assault tank. It was full of murderers and people who were doing life. I wasn't supposed to be there. I never put hands on anybody. I'm living in a, in a four by nine size room and the doors are closed, you know, 22 hours of the day. And I would just pace and pace and pace and pace. And this old man, they called him Uwe. He says, you're doing hard time. And he says, man, they're gonna chew you off the bone. I said, what do you mean hard time? He says, you're out in that world. Get out of that world. And then something happened. At a very young age, I, um, I felt very confused. My grandfather, he violated me and started sexually abusing me um, at a young age. Um, and it was, the, it was the first time I, I kept a secret. I wanted this perception on the outside of our home that we were a normal family. But deep down inside, it was just darkness. When my grandfather would come over, he, he, it was a look that he gave me that was, God, it was, creepy. It was almost like a flirtatious look. You know, he would be the one that would babysit us. And, and it was terrifying because he was always prowling and, and following me and, and touching me. I was being told by my parents, you know, you're just like your grandfather. Mannerisms, the way you talk, even down to my handwriting. And then they would tell me I'm going to grow up to be just like him. And that really confused me. And my solution to confusion was chaos. When I drank and I did drugs, I started feeling like everybody around me looked. You know, in high school, I, I um, attempted to take my own life. I got in my car and I saw a telephone pole and I just nailed it. Went through the windshield, woke up in a hospital. Man, I'm still alive. I'm gonna get in trouble. When I would, would meet someone and, and I felt like I was trying to let them close, if they did not want to be around me, I felt abandoned and, and you know, my solution to that was radical. In 2011, I encountered my first encounter with the law. 27 mugshots. Aggravated assault tank full of murderers. Pace and pace and pace. Man, they're going to chew you off the bone. And then something happened. I got this book called The Living Recovery Bible from a gangbanger who was using it as a pillow. This man, Uwe, who is my celly, which is my cellmate, um, who's doing life for murder, asked me to read to him. And I said, why? He says, I can't read. I can't write. And as I'm reading this to him, nothing's happening, but I start recognizing and feeling that four days go by and I'm not pacing anymore. And I'm like, wow, this is really interesting because I wasn't anxious and paranoid. And I start reading this and it's the story of Joseph. I'm like, man, this is my story. And on July 7th, 2017, I, I woke up out of a sleep on the top bunk. And, you know, I never, pr I didn't pray anything. I wasn't like, you know, come into my life, save me. I just woke up and I sat up. I, t 
took this deep breath and I felt like I was having a heart attack. And I just go, what is wrong with me? What is wrong with me? And I'm doing this and Uwe's sleeping and I just go, oh, I mean, oh. And as I did that, this feeling of, of all this hate, anger, resentment, and just all these feelings are just coming out of my body. And I take this deep breath and I just go, oh, like that. And it was just like ice water coming into my body. And I'm like going, wow, I feel so much love. And I'm like looking around and I'm looking at guards and I go, I love that dude, I love her, I love him. And I look down at Uwe, I said, love him. And man, just something happened. And, and then I started reading the Bible again. It started making sense to me. And then another inmate comes in and he says, man, what are you doing? I said, man, I'm just doing me. So these mob, this whole group of these murderers come hanging out with me. And I read something to them. They go, what are you reading? I read it to them. They said, well, you keep reading to us. I said, well, why? They said, we can't read. And I mean, I looked up at God and I said, man, I see you. I see you. And I was reading more and more. And as I'm doing this, this tank starts coming closer and closer together. The guards were just amazed that this tank was so close and we were serving one another. And I realized that the reason why I was at peace and I was at home and I felt safe is because reading to people for the first time I was out of self and I was serving someone else. On October 13, 2017, um, they came over the microphone and they said, Michael Moulton, uh, clean your bunk and collect your junk. And the whole tank is like, what is going on? I was released because of a technicality, a paperwork error. Once I got outside and I could see the sun for the first time and feel air and breathe in and then fear crept in. What do I do? Where do I go? I have no money. I have nobody, no one to call. And God said, walk, not audibly. I, I used to hear people say that. I thought that was witchcraft. And he spoke to me through thoughts and feelings. And he told me to walk. <clears throat> so I made the journey 300 miles uh, back to Dallas uh, to turn myself in. That's where Judge Bennett was. And she said, when you get released, come back and see me. So I did. I show up to Judge Bennett's court and she said, I've heard what you've been doing. Word got back to her through inmates that were coming to see her, saying that this guy that they were locked up with has changed their life. And she says, I don't want to get in the way of that. I'm going to set you free. I said, I'm already free. And she pardoned me and said, go pay it forward. That's what I'm doing. You know, all the times I was hitting rock bottom, I was always digging to get out of the bottom. And what I was doing is I was using the tools that got me to rock bottom. I was using the same tools to get out of the bottom. Resentment, anger, I'll show you. I'm gonna make the comeback. This last time I stayed at the bottom. You know, I finally realized that the rock at the bottom in all these times was God. Why would I want, you know, want to run from the rock? So I stayed next to the rock. My relationship with Christ is, <laughs> it's a very intimate relationship. I mean, it, it's a personal relationship. He's my homeboy, you know, he's my buddy. He loves me for exactly who I am. Um, he forgives me. I still betray him to this day, but I realize it and I come running back to him. He'll never betray me, will never abandon me. He's a very simple person for a complicated person like me. My name is Michael Moulton, also known as M to the Rock, and I am second. <laughs>